So uh, we're halfway through. Now that we've had a chance to talk about uh, the protocols and give an overview of not only their anatomy, the overarching themes, and uh, some of the case studies that demonstrate how the protocols have been uh, implemented at uh, non-tribal institutions here in the US. Uh, we're gonna kind of provide you with some tools for, uh, uh, for, for preparation. And in this segment, um, uh, uh, both myself and Veronica Reyes Escudero uh, back here will be, uh, we're both with non-tribal organizations. And so the, the whole point of the second half is really preparation work by non-tribal institutions uh, um, to kind of demonstrate how we have implemented these protocols and also provide you with some additional tools uh, to help you, uh, given the fact that the protocols, or given the fact that you should come to expect more tribal initiated uh, connections now that the protocols have been endorsed. So we're gonna start with uh, an introduction to a range of interactions. And for this uh, brief segment, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the Sam Noble Museum where I work. Um, I've been there for about uh, eight years. And we are uh, the premier natural history museum for the state of Oklahoma that focuses not only on the landscape and the peoples and, and, uh, and whatnot of the state of Oklahoma, but the world at large. Uh, the history of the museum, as I had mentioned earlier today, goes back to the 1800s. Um, and at, uh, throughout most of the, the 1900s, the various collections under the purview of what was then just known as the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History before, before being renamed the Sam Noble Museum in 2000, uh, was that we had all of these different, um, uh, mostly biological science collections, but also um, two life, I mean, I'm sorry, two social science collections, that being archeology span and ethnology, all of which were scattered around campus in various buildings dependent on how space was available and allocated. And looking through historical documents in my own research about the History Museum, it's, it's fascinating. There's even information that details that uh, some collections were even stored under the bleachers of the football stadium and in all sorts of places that are just simply not uh, up to par with today's standards. So in 2000, uh, the director of the museum uh, you know, his plan was to essentially build a new uh, facility that brings all of the collections together and to expand the purpose of the museum uh, uh, to not only have all the collections under the same roof, but really saw this as an opportunity for a more inclusive model for telling the story of not only Earth's natural history, um, but also to include um, uh, other perspectives that were not being represented. And so, to, uh, I should go back, the, the building, which is on the University of Oklahoma campus, is deemed by the state of Oklahoma as a T5 shelter. That means it can sustain a level five tornado, and we're in Tornado Alley, that's very common there, and so people feel good about depositing their stuff at our building, <laughs> where they're uh, safe. Um, and, and so, in 2002, uh, one of the new uh, implementations was to build a Native Amer uh, was to establish a Native American languages collection. And uh, at the time, uh, the room that was allocated was a very small room. There was no collection whatsoever. There was essentially a table, um, and the director uh, had hired a new uh, curator who had had uh, uh, a linguist who had ha who's now with the Smithsonian Institution, who had had a long uh, history of establishing meaningful relationships with native communities, and, um, and essentially said, build me a collection from the ground up. So a big job in front of her. And the first thing that she did was set, um, was establish some goals. One, to build a collection that concentrates uh, on the oral and written native languages of Oklahoma uh, and the greater North American continent, to carry out research, especially the documentation of indigenous uh, languages that are facing the rapid loss of uh, speakers and in the formulation, implementation, and evaluation of strategies for uh, reversing language shift. Uh, third goal was to provide services to native communities and language programs such as recording, archiving, and migrating materials, language policy awareness, grant writing, 
and training in linguistics and native language teaching and acquisition, and to educate the broader Oklahoma and world community, community on the history and continued importance of native languages. And so when you look at these goals, you can kind of see how the protocols, which had not been established yet, there, there are elements of them that sort of exist in what was her vision at the time of, of uh, creating this, this new collection uh, that was really meant to help um, not only native communities, but again to help educate the, the broader community in Norman, Oklahoma and, and, and elsewhere. So just for a little bit of background information about the collection, we ha uh, the Native American Languages Collection, also referred to as the NALC as its acronym, has three main departments. We have an archive, we have a reference library, and then we also have an audio and video digitization lab slash recording studio, and I'll kind of uh, demonstrate uh, a little bit about what happens in each of those areas. Um, uh, we are the newest collection in the uh, museum, aside from the collection of genomic resources. So uh, it, uh, at this point in the archive, we have over 8,000 cataloged items that represent more than 300 indigenous languages. And these materials include audio and video recordings, unpublished uh, 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 paper documents, educational curricula, pedagogy, teaching materials, newspapers, maps, calendars, ephemera, we have also, um, uh, over the last couple of years, really been getting into archiving more non-traditional formats, such as Flex databases. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Flex is a, a software program that um, aids in creating online dictionaries. Uh, and also uh, backups of apps and other non-traditional formats. Uh, so, for example, we are working with the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, who um, has been working tirelessly in conjunction with the Rosetta Stone project to make Chickasaw uh, as a language available through Rosetta. And so we serve as a backup repository for, their, uh, for everything that goes into their apps. And we're also working on a current project with the Osage Nation of Oklahoma, who has just uh, created uh, an online app for language learning as well. And uh, of all these materials, they essentially come from tribes, individuals, families, and to some extent, linguists. <clears throat> to kind of highlight some of our collection strengths, uh, uh, we have the largest collection of Degiha language family materials, the Degiha language family consisting of Ose, Jomaha, Ponca, Ka, and Kwapa. Uh, we have our Willem de Roos collection. He's a, 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 a linguist who has worked with the Plains Apache people for uh, well over 40 years. Uh, so these are a lot of his elicitation sessions and uh, texts uh, for in Plains Apache, which is a very underdocumented language. Uh, our Margaret Malden collection. Margaret Malden is the former uh, uh, Muscogee Creek instructor on the University of Campus um, who recently passed away and her daughter is now the new instructor. So um, she actually uh, utilized our recording studio to do a lot of um, uh, uh, on-site recordings in Creek and that's one way in which we build the collection. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then we also have a large collection of uh, uh, native, ling uh, native language readers and bilingual curriculum. And with each new acquisition, uh, communi community consultation is met as a sign of respect and to ensure the safety of potentially sacred and sensitive materials. We have only uh, just uh, within the last year ado uh, formally adopted the protocols ourselves um, even though, going back to the history of the department over the last 17 years, the, the spirit of them, which is, I really liked the word that you used, has always kind of been there, but, um, uh, uh, but it was something that we wanted to formally announce and make sure was recognized. Um, <clears throat> but within that time, that spirit has been there and there have been activities uh, alongside of native communities that I'll demonstrate in just a moment that have shown that the, um, the protocols were essentially always there. <clears throat> Some of our ongoing partnerships uh, include those with the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is a uh, bulletin from the Shawnee, Eastern Shawnee Tribe's uh, newsletter that they send out every month. And you can see, or, see here on the bottom that uh, as indicated in the protocols and um, as a part of guidelines for native communities for 
um, one of which is to publicly inform uh, folks of how they are partnering with non-tribal institutions. And so down here, there's a statement about that relationship that was formalized between the Sam Noble Museum and uh, the Shawnee Tribe, the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. <coughs> Uh, we've participated in two grant-funded projects with the Wichita and Affiliated Tribes of Oklahoma. Uh, most recently, the Oral History Project, which is um, a series of videos that were uh, recorded by the Wichita Tribe. Uh, uh, they lost their last fluent uh, speaker of the Wichita language uh, <coughs> within the last uh, year and a half. And so uh, these videos are essentially quite uh, um, unique and valuable in that they are interviews with that last speaker. And, uh, and so we serve as a backup repository to the tribe. The uh, original recordings are down in um, Anadarko, Oklahoma, which is about a 45 minute drive southwest of where we are uh, in the Oklahoma City metro. And, uh, and then, but what the Wichita tribe wanted was uh, knowing that, um, especially with the establishment of the new Native American Studies Department on the OU campus, uh, was that they wanted to make sure that uh, Wichita materials were available to students, not only within that department, but also local resources or, or uh, other local uh, researchers who may not have the ability to get down to Anadarko in the same uh, way that they can easily access them on campus. Uh, we have also worked with the, um, uh, the Lenape tribe uh, uh, in their dictionaries that they have formulated over the course of the last uh, essentially uh, three decades. Um, and so we're a backup repository for them. I mentioned the uh, partnership with uh, the Chickasaw Nation. Um, we've partnered with the Seminole uh, language tribe uh, who actually unfortunately just lost funding um, to keep their education program alive due to state budget cuts and other um, issues. And so uh, that's really important because the, at least those materials are archived and um, the tribe can still refer uh, people to us for access and, and, and whatnot. And, um, and then uh, uh, Kind of emphasizing that these and all partnerships and projects, I've only listed you know, some ongoing partnerships you know, for space reasons, but that these uh, all did not come to fruition overnight, that this really took time over the course of 17 years. As I mentioned, it started off, the department started off with essentially no resources. And so this has really been 17 years of establishing trust between uh, the museum and, and the communities that we serve. Uh, and all agreements are well documented uh, through not only correspondences in, uh, in electronic and print versions, um, but also we have formalized um, a depositor packet, which all of you should have received. I wanted to provide you with that because the important thing there is that when the department was first established, um, the museum as a whole was only working off of one single deed of gift, which was you're encapsulating all of this legal information into one page, uh, which may not be enough room to not only capture all of the, the meat of what's necessary, uh, but uh, more uh, problematic is that one deed of gift, how does that uh, verbiage um, apply appropriately to 12 different life and social science departments? In respects to the NALC, um, one concern with a lot of our depositors was that the deed of gift essentially um, quite blatantly states that uh, um, uh, deposits um, turn the rights over to the museum. And this was a big red flag for native tribes who wanted to be able to retain the rights of uh, the materials that they uh, held rights to. And so, um, I won't go through the depositor packet, but maybe for some uh, uh, bedtime reading or whatnot, you can look through that and kind of see how we have adapted uh, the language in accordance with tribal community members. Um, all of this was, was with their help uh, to make sure that we alleviate any sort of tension or uncertainty that may exist between and across tribes. And similarly to the protocols, 
of Native American materials, as well as the protocols that were established at the American Philosophical Society. All of these are living documents, so you can see how there's an updated uh, date, and so as new issues arise, we uh, update them accordingly. For example, one project that we're working on is uh, making, uh, we have four levels of access. We have open access, which is level one. Level two is open access, but only on site. Um, uh, level three is when a time limit is put onto archival materials. This is especially important for linguists or other researchers who may be uh, still in the process of conducting field work. They want to archive their materials but not have their research available uh, in full until they're done with their publications and whatnot. Um, and so, and then the fourth uh, restriction is when the depositor or someone else has control over the resource, whether it be a tribal community or whatnot. <clears throat> Oh, yes, good question. DEL stands for Documenting Endangered Languages. This is actually a subsidiary of uh, the National Science Foundation. However, I just got an email this morning that was saying the NSF is trying to, uh, you know, sort of change their, their routes and everything. So uh, in the future, you may or may not see DEL as an option, but rather there's something that's already lumped into NSF. But good question. But yes, documenting endangered languages. So I mentioned we have a reference library. This is kind of a multi-purpose room, and it doesn't. This slide doesn't show you the uh, the whole room, but this is essentially the room where everything started. The shelves were empty. Actually, there were no shelves. We invested some money through grants to get compact shelving to help with space. Um, and this is a multifunctional room that not only serves as our reading room for uh, patrons when they come to the museum, uh, and we can fetch materials from the archive, bring them down for them. Uh, this is mostly uh, where our archive uh, consists of materials that are uh, unique or that require um, uh, extra care. Our archive, I should mention, is a temperature and humidity controlled room. So uh, reference materials and published books are essentially kept here in the reading room. Um, we have both uh, a section for accessioned books, journals, and other uh, resources, as well as a separate section uh, that's really uh, for non-accessioned um, supplemental reference materials that um, are really just there. That, um, as I should state, that the Native American Languages uh, collection, uh, in terms of its archival materials, um, are really dedicated to materials that contain uh, non-English languages. And so the supplemental reference materials would be, say, um, uh, books on general history of you know, a particular tribe or other things that are in English, uh, um, or other sorts of guides um, to, uh, you know, for example, guides to tribal affiliated organizations and, and other things. Um, uh, as well as education curricula that is um, maybe helpful to um, uh, curriculum developers that, again, are supplemental to the primary resources. Uh, and I also should mention that this is also a big focus here is in pro uh, providing materials that are not only um, uh, written about Native peoples, but also written by them. Um, and. And so this falls in line with chapter two of the protocols of striving for balance and content and perspective. This is also, uh, the, the reading room also serves as a classroom. Um, uh, originally it served as a classroom for some, for linguistics classes such as morphology, syntax, phonology, and these sort of courses that are upper division that usually have only three or four you know, graduate students, and rather than occupying a, a large auditorium on campus, uh, we found that students really like having a small setting where they have curators and collection staff, primary resources, all of which are at their disposal that can help them with project design and development. And so, uh, needless to say, uh, we're a small uh, knit group. Myself is the collection manager, and then we have our curator, and so we wear a lot of hats. Uh, in terms of helping uh, students and community members and 
uh, in addition to um, uh, collection management and curatorial duties. Um, most recently, this has evolved with the, uh, with the establishment of the uh, Native American Studies Program at OU. Uh, so now we have regular um, uh, classes uh, for NAS students, um, as well as partnering school groups. Uh, what you see here on the right is a group from the University of Texas at Arlington who came up, um, this was a couple of years ago, they came up as a group of, uh, these are all aspiring uh, archive, library, and collection professionals uh, who are interested in working um, either in tribal or non-tribal organizations that really wanted to learn about how to work with archival materials and what it's like to be an archivist. And so we set up a, a one-week workshop where they can get some hands-on experience in that. Um, and then we've also developed a rather robust uh, internship program, uh, especially with, uh, in conjunction with the NAS department. Uh, that way um, uh, students can get uh, course credit either through the NAS program or through their uh, tribal community. Um, We also do all of our manuscript digitization. Uh, you'll see one of our students from the Osage tribe happily digitizing uh, manuscripts. Uh, this, is a really, this was a really great project. I mentioned earlier one of our uh, uh, holdings in the collection is the largest collection of Degiha uh, language family materials um, that were given to us as part of a bequest. And um, so this was an opportunity since a lot of the materials, even though they were quite well organized by the collector, there was a lot of information that was unknown about the materials. And so we invited the Osage Nation to work with us uh, in the processing of these collections and set up um, an opportunity for a student to help us with not only manuscript digitization, uh, several transcription and translation projects, and also uh, the language program coordinator for the Osage tribe helped in determining uh, whether or not certain materials were culturally sensitive and also providing enriching context to the, to the metadata and the supplemental uh, materials such as the transcriptions and translations that were being created. And it has turned into one of our uh, most heavily used collections because of how uh, discoverable and um, accurate the, uh, this project turned out to be. We also do our cataloging in here. Um, again, this is in relation to chapter five of the protocols of providing context. Um, again, these are uh, several of our students or our interns um, who helped uh, in, uh, in our cataloging. And then this is also an area where we um, conduct uh, planning for public programs, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, in just a moment. We do have an AV digitization lab and recording studio slash my office, so you can see that a lot of things are happening in small spaces. <laughs> uh, and we have three uh, audio stations where um, we uh, can essentially have three different projects going on at one time where we can, can um, uh, uh, transfer a variety of non-digital materials uh, ranging from Hi8 tapes to audio cassettes to vinyl records to VHS tapes, etc into uh, digital formats. And um, again, as part of our internship program, this is an area that interns can work in to learn about audio preservation techniques. Uh, they can learn about, um, if any of you are familiar with the phenomenon known as sticky shed syndrome. Uh, and if not, I definitely encourage you to look it up, especially when you, if you live in a very humid area such, uh, such as the south. Uh, so they get to learn a lot about um, uh, uh, sort of what goes on in engineering and transfer work. Um, uh, we also provide off-site services available uh, to elders and others who can't physically come to the museum. We actually have, a, uh, through a grant, we were able to purchase a mobile recording studio where we can go out to communities and uh, provide recording services for communities who want to document uh, their language or to document uh, um, uh, um, uh, certain uh, certain events, and uh, and the image that you see is Margaret Malden, the Creek instructor on campus, uh, who um, uh, one of her projects that she worked on was to read front to back the New Testament entirely in Creek, and have it recorded and put into the collection. So 
quite a quite a quite a feat. And all of this ties into this model that the uh, original curator of the department uh, started, which was known as the community-based language archive model, which essentially states that community members who serve as stakeholders in language archival materials can play a direct role in the shaping, processing, and delivery of archival records. So that initial statement that she gave 17 years ago is essentially in line with the protocols that we know today. And so this model advocates the involvement and participation between the native language community, archivists, as well as linguists in documenting, contextualizing, maintaining, and disseminating information. Uh, one thing that happened uh, um, uh, within this new model for the museum uh, in terms of how it provides information to uh, patrons and communities uh, was um, in the form of exhibits. And so one, one uh, area that we specifically, uh, or I say we in the royal sense, uh, uh, there's an area known as the, uh, a gallery known as the Hall of the People of Oklahoma. And really the purpose of this exhibit space, this permanent exhibit space, was to tell the story of um, the Oklahoma landscape, but with the perspective of native peoples. And one way of doing that is if you look closely, all of these handprints that are on the wall are actual handprints of native peoples who helped in the design of, of this gallery wing. Um, and so there's a little bit of a story about the participants involved um, and including uh, youth student, uh, students um, who are now you know, obviously in, um, in their older age who can come back and see the development of this wing and, and, and the ways that it has evolved. So as you go uh, through the galleries and learn about um, uh, the people of Oklahoma, everything that you read is in um, conjunction with the participation of uh, tribal members. Um, and out of the 39 federally recognized tribes in the state, um, I'm wanting to say that over 30 were involved in the construction of this, uh, uh, of this wing. We also have an orientation gallery. Uh, this is a permanent exhibit space that features the voices of uh, native people in Oklahoma in their language. So where the, um, in the previous slides, uh, you know, the, the text was um, uh, uh, written in collaboration with tribes. In the orientation gallery, when you actually walk underneath this sort of cylindrical feature, it will automatically prompt recordings of native speakers who talk about the collections in their language. And so that was a way to, because a big question that we're often, uh, that's often raised with our department is how does a native language collection get properly represented on an exhibit's front? And so this is one way that we were able to incorporate that. Um, there's also signage that is in various languages and we're always exploring new opportunities to provide a welcoming uh, space for community members. We also uh, have traveling exhibits. This was a, an exhibit that we worked on um, in conjunction with the, Wyandot, the Huron Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma uh, on the centennial celebration of Charles Marius Barbeau. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's actually a controversial figure who was a Canadian folklorist and anthropologist um, who is controversial because a lot of his uh, work really um, misrepresented uh, the, the, the Wyandotte people. And so way, one way to sort of fix the, the, the wrongdoings of his uh, work as an anthropologist and folklorist was to create this exhibit with the help of the Wyandotte people. And so they were welcomed in and all of the placards and all of the descriptions that you see associated with the galleries are written by uh, uh, Wyandotte community members. And uh, you can actually see an image here on the bottom right of Wyandotte members essentially engaging with the materials in this, um, uh, uh, in this exhibit, um, which allowed them uh, you know, to understand that what the museum was trying to do was really to try and uh, you know, fix these wrongdoings of, of Mr. Barbeau. And this, in addition, um, was turned into a online exhibit that you can still access uh, at the URL that's right there. 
which was especially helpful for people who were not able to come to the exhibit while it was up. Uh, most recently, we uh, participated, or we were, um, you know, we, we partnered with the American Library Association and the, um, uh, the National Institute of Medicine in Maryland to get the traveling exhibit, Native Voices, Native Peoples, Concepts of Health and Healing. This is an oral history exhibit that was up for a month um, that essentially had all of these kiosks with um, audio and video recordings of of uh, native peoples from across the North American continent and what folks could come and do. And it was made completely free to, uh, to um, the public um, rather than any sort of entrance fee. They could come in and they can listen to oral histories um, and, uh, and learn of other sorts of um, things that the, the people that appear in these videos and these recordings have to say. So, and there's a ton of content that, you know, would allow them to really, you know, uh, dig deep and spend some time there at the museum. And that uh, was also turned into a virtual exhibit that is now available online as well. We hold uh, both cultural and film festivals, most recently our Caddo Festival. This is a annual symposium for uh, usually surrounding films, Caddo dancing, art exhi exhibitions, staged readings. Uh, we also have our Native Crossroads Film Fest um, that takes place every spring. Uh, this is a multi-day symposium showcasing um, films um, uh, made by Native community members, um, all of which are based on a particular theme for that year. We also have other film screenings. For example, we partnered with the Navajo Nation, and uh, who had originally partnered with George Lucas Films to create the first ma uh, major motion picture uh, major Hollywood motion picture to ever be dubbed into a native language. So we were one of about 49 locations in the U.S. that got to screen Star Wars in Navajo. And this was especially cool and quite uh, um, emotional to see folks who came all the way from Arizona, New Mexico, Missouri, South Dakota, just to hear Darth Vader speak Navajo. And you know, uh, it brings tears to your eyes and really shows that, you know, this is why you get up in the morning and go to work, is to create these sorts of, um, uh, uh, these partnerships. And then perhaps our, uh, indeed our biggest uh, public program is the Oklahoma Native American Youth Language Fair. Some of you may be familiar with this because we get a lot of folks from uh, Arizona and New Mexico. This is a base, um, spring is our busy time for our department with our film festivals and everything else. But this is essentially a two-day uh, event that takes place the first Monday and Tuesday of every April in which pre-K through 12th graders can demonstrate how they're learning their native language. And they can do this through a variety of public performances, songs, dances, uh, skits, etc. And then there are also um, opportunities for physical submissions. So there's a poster art contest. Some students make books, comic books, etc. And that's especially helpful for uh, students who maybe don't have the ability to actually come to the fair but want to participate. And then those materials are actually, um, uh, uh, or can be put into the archive um, as a way of, of uh, collecting or uh, building the collection. We also hold workshops and seminars. Um, one uh, recent one in 2017 was the Native American Music as Intellectual and Cultural Property legal issues and practical approaches. This was a great uh, collaborative event um, uh, to bring people together to talk about um, uh, the, uh, the issues in collecting native music. We have also uh, held the National Breath of Life Silent No More workshop. Uh, this is a workshop that um, originally started with uh, UC Berkeley and then moved on to the Smithsonian Institution and, and in conjunction with the Sam Noble Museum. Uh, and this is a, a one week workshop in which um, uh, um, Native community members can come and learn how to use archival resources, not only in the museum, but at other um, uh, institutions on campus. And this is especially useful for um, uh, those who no longer have uh, fluent first language speakers, so they can really kind of um, uh, uh, get help from uh, and share ideas with other participants. We uh, held the Native American Youth Video Documentation Workshop. This was exclusive to the museum and um, is a, a workshop where ninth through 12th graders 
can come and learn how to uh, use video equipment for uh, working with community members in their own communities to help document their language and create oral history projects. And at the end of the, uh, the week, um, they, uh, you know, throughout the week they create a project and by the end of the week they present it to the group and they even get this sort of little uh, certificate of, of completion at the end. Uh, we've engaged in uh, published materials. We ha um, most recently we produced a, um, uh, with the University of Oklahoma Press, what's called a language in the home how-to kit. This is really in regards to uh, language revitalization efforts. So with so many native languages losing uh, fluent speakers, um, we wanted to help facilitate and encourage uh, language use in the home. And we're actually working to make that available online right now to, uh, to help uh, uh, with that. But physical copies can be obtained at the museum. And we also worked with the, uh, uh, the Kiowa tribe to produce a children's storybook, as well as the, uh, the Yuchi tribe in Oklahoma to create a songbook. And so these are just some of the ideas that we've had and some of the range of interactions uh, that we've engaged in to help maybe kind of put a bug in any of your ears. Or, and, um, and so really to kind of encapsulate all of this is showing that this range of interactions um, you know, by developing holdings that are comprehensive, inclusive, and reflect all key perspectives on Native American issues, uh, resources by Native Americans, not just those about Native Americans, uh, as a courtesy and to ensure the safety and potentially sacred sensitive materials, seek the opportunities for consultation with Native American communities uh, by cont contacting the appropriate people uh, which are listed in the protocols. Uh, document agreements, partnerships with communities through formal MOUs, depositor packets, and or other contracts. Honor those commitments and, and, and tailor your, um, your documentation accordingly to fit the needs of both partners. Exhibits, workshops, seminars provide an opportunity for creating welcoming and comfortable spaces for visitors, raising awareness of Native communities and issues while including Native perspectives, all of which again fall in line with the protocols. A community-based model that I talked about earlier in areas ranging from cataloging to preservation services can help foster reciprocal education and training and the provision of accurate, valuable context to eliminate outdated, inaccurate, derogatory, or Eurocentric language that impedes access. Um, and through such efforts, Native American communities can recognize that libraries and archives can help preserve documentary materials, promote revitalization, and support community goals. And then, uh, just again, emphasizing that to be mindful that in most cases, that's, this uh, will not happen overnight. So for this next section, we want to get into uh, uh, the notion of collections auditing. And so one thing that we have provided to all of you, not physically today, but um, uh, online. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, where beforehand it was open access, those with a time restriction and those with um, uh, access restrictions. And as we are moving into this uh, new project of making materials, uh, some of our uh, open access materials online to create um, uh, an avenue for those folks who want to deposit materials with us but only have them available on site still. Uh, Feedback that we got from a lot of Native students uh, at OU was um, help in citing primary resources. So uh, we, we constructed a field that was aimed at providing accurate citation information that we can easily deliver to them. And then uh, the uh, other big thing that we received feedback from was methods for connecting to other collections on campus. And so in talking about um, collaborative initiatives, uh, a, a recent collaborative initiative that we've had in conjunction with the Carl Albert Center, which is a, a political archive that we have on campus, um, was creating what's known as OUARC, which stands for OU, Oklahoma University Archival Research Collections. And what this does is this is an online portal that we've created using archive space in which um, participating um, archives on campus, that being our Russian Ballet Archive, our Political Communication Center, the National Weather Center, Etc. cetera, um, folks can go into this portal and search for a particular term. We'll, um, 
uh, uh, or whatever, and it will automatically search the holdings of all the collections on campus rather than forcing them to go to each individual website or, um, or, or database for all those respective institutions. So it really saves researchers a lot of, a lot of time and frustration. And so at this time, we are going to connect uh, uh, Veronica Reyes Escudero, who is going to talk a little bit about the audit that was conducted at her institution. So uh, if you need to take a five minute break while she gets connected, uh, this would be the time to do so. Hello, good morning, or still morning, right? <laughs> Um, and so um, I prepared just you know a short presentation, so I'll have to stick to my reading here as, as much as I can. Um, thank you everybody for coming, and thank you to Stephen and Nicholas for including me. I'm uh, um, honored to be part of this. I've been very interested in, in all of this work. Um, I'm also honored to be standing in uh, Tohono O'odham lands, um, and thank you for for offering that to us today, this morning. Um, so I'm Veronica Reyes Escudero, um, a librarian and borderlands curator, as well as instruction coordinator at the University of Arizona uh, Library Special Collections. And I just realized I didn't bring my glasses up here. I'm sorry, I need to get my glasses. Sorry to the recording. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where I left them. Oh, there they are. And I can't look at you when I'm reading, so. Uh. Um, I, so I worked on a version of this presentation, um, just to be upfront, with Wendell Cox um, for the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums in 2016. I started in Special Collections in 2004. One of my charges was to manage the Borderlands collections. There was much to be done there, and a couple of years into my tenure, I've, a few things were conjoining. One was my need to understand the collections relevant to the Borderlands, which I had already started uh, as soon as I started, but in particular, the Mexican and Mexican-American presence and native voices. Two, there was an urgency, real or imagined, at that time at my institution to identify digitization projects. Third, the Native American protocols were gaining momentum. Through my lens as Borderlands curator and even through my lens as a member of a marginalized group, I can see that there is a tension we might experience in the want for greater access to materials and the uncertainty whether materials should be accessible at all. If we want our stories to be part of the historical record though, and a fully integral uh, body of research to exist and be represented in the way the community desires, our voices need to be represented in our collections. And they must be as integral as any other communities in our historical record. My primary intent at this time then was to survey the collections to, better, to gain a better understanding of existing gaps whose voices were missing. We'll focus here on the Native American Materials Survey. So I hadn't included a, a, a context for our, our collection, um, but these are our seven areas uh, um, of collecting scope, the missing piece there is the University of Arizona History. So you can get a kind of sense that this is a very traditional academic library special collections with uh, uh, variant um, uh, collecting scopes. Uh, and none of us were specifically um, curators for Native American materials. Okay, so I took this on as Borderlands curator at the, at the time. As Borderlands curator and librarian in special collections, um, I look for representation in our historical record. And for this, documentation is needed. By closely examining, sorry, I'm on the next slide. By closely examining uh, indigenous content through audit, we would be better able to understand our collections. 
My intention was also to create a collections guide in order to enhance access for researchers, and that includes, of course, the community at large. And with a better handle on our content, we might be in a better position to respond to, call, to the calls and the protocols. Another intention was to prepare ourselves to the possibility of finding culturally sensitive materials, and lastly, to identify potential projects and opportunities for relationship building. Anxiety over not knowing whether there are items in our collections that need attention can be paralyzing. This also leaves us with, the, with an inability to be responsive to our own administrators and others' concerns, as well as not be able to consider whether we should be restricting access or whether items need special treatment, be it for preservation needs or for better access. It's better to know. What I'm offering here are not answers that will fit all of us, but a suggested approach to um, get us closer to be responsive to the protocols. A couple of years into attempting to finalize the survey with modest progress and a couple of false starts and restarts, the protocols for Native American archival materials seemed to gain some footing in the archival and special collections community. So I was re-inspired and the lucky happenstance that Wendell Cox, who is now a Dartmouth, would be working with us and would bring with him much needed resource, expertise, and a strong background and understanding of uh, the need to conduct such a survey. We focus on the 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona with the addition of the Seti and Zuni because of our placement here along the border with New Mexico and Mexico. With materials in our photo collections, vertical files, and other formats, we focused only on the then processed collections. We searched catalog records and online finding aids to understand volume and to identify preservation issues. We examined almost all relevant materials firsthand and counted leaves and pages in folders, containers, and collections. So this is what our, um, our spreadsheet looked like at, the, uh, at that time. I wish I had the one that has been developed at this point, so please use that one. It's, it looks amazing. Um, and uh, so along, along the way, we added some things as we were learning. Here are some, uh, some of our methodological uh, challenges. Not only were there over 1,000 process collections uh, we could be possibly surveying, but limiting ourselves to process collections would necessitate to continue auditing as collections got processed. It also left other areas unsurveyed, such as our photo collections, our audiovisual material, etc. The multiple objectives, which I mentioned earlier, made for an ambitious audit. We also experienced needing to rescope the project as we learned during the review, such as making sure we added notes on intellectual property where we could. During, the, during this process, we also realized that more, more certainty with more certainty that we could not make the final determination as to restrictions, we would simply flag for further consultation. At the start of the survey, only about, um, only some of the collections uh, had online finding aids as well, if, then that's so hard to believe, but it was true then. The biggest challenge, of course, is that it excluded unprocessed collections, and these would um, have its own challenges. but we also saw some opportunities. The opportunities the audit provided were some expected, and, but some unexpected. With Wendell on board, it gave us an opportunity to, meaning more resource, um, it gave us an opportunity to develop the guide and survey spreadsheet and notes for extensive descriptions of materials. We ended with over 350 pages of description for, for potential projects, um, of the actual audit, the, the, the spreadsheet, um, including notes, research notes um, that that he came across, um, and you know, as, as he was doing the survey, he would write notes, etc. So a lot of content in that. Um, right now, it's a paper binder. We enhanced our knowledge of the collections. We also identified un unknown resources. Therefore, leaving us, certainly me, with an enlarged vision of the materials and their relevance 
such as understanding that political collections offered an exceptional resource for sovereignty and self-government. This is what I sought out to look for in the first place, the people's own voices represented in the historical record, and of course provided me with a background in our collections to begin relationship building. As we finalized the survey, we vetted the guide and in some cases the notes and spreadsheets with members of the American Indian Studies community and asked for their thoughts and feedback. Invariably, we received positive responses at having ready, a ready list of collections they might explore to further the research. I have to say, though, that surveying did not fully alleviate our anxiety, or mine anyway. While in our survey we did not find materials having to do with human remains, we quickly realized that we wouldn't be able to make determinations as to sensitive material with 100% certainty. The hard work, but faithful work, of relationship building has begun, and it is my hope that with an open heart and open mind, we can find a good way to continue. And here are a couple of resources for further explication of our audit process. I couldn't go very much in, in depth um, today, uh, but that, uh, that volume of collection management is highly recommended if you're interested in indigenous methodology and collection development. Um, we also, I also included uh, Marita Baldock's and Wendell Cox's article on um, th where they specifically focused on the uh, political papers. Um, Marita used, was at that time our collect, um, congressional archivist. So I just want to take us to our current state, um, sort of in a fast forward mode. So where we are with that, um, one of the main things is that with the protocols, it's, there's really, you, somebody mentioned that it's an iterative process, it's not linear, and so you can start doing some things, um, but it's very hard to do a lot of the relationship building, I think, without really getting to know what your collections are. So the audit, I think, is super important. So the, the guidelines for the stewardship of archival materials by or about indigenous peoples at the University of Arizona Library Special Collections um, were developed in the spirit and line um, with suggested approaches shared in the protocols of Native American archival materials and the antecedent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander protocols for libraries, archives, and information services, which came out of Australia. So we had important um, campus partners to develop these. That was Karen Francis Begay, who's Assistant Vice President of Tribal Relations, Claudia Nelson, Director of the Native People's Technical Assistance Office, Mary Graham, then Head of Library and Archives at the Arizona State Museum, along with Janelle Wakeley, who was the Curator for Photographic Collections at the State Museum, Martina Dali, also of the State Museum, who's Assistant Curator, American Indian Relations, and Melissa Tatum, Professor of Law, specializing in tribal jurisdiction, tribal courts, as well as issues relating to cultural property and sacred places. Having these campus partnerships aided us in, um, uh, in campus-wide buy-in, uh, but also in identifying the right representatives and um, negotiating when it wasn't straightforward in, in terms of who we should contact. They were natural campus partners because um, we were developed, the campus was developing the Arizona Board of Regents Tribal Consultation Policy, um, which affirms the commitment to respectful government to government relationships with sovereign nations, native nations, and the UA guidelines um, which uh, were in developed in support of the ABERS policy, outlining institutional processes and procedures of respectful and ethical research and institutional engagements um, with Native nations. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to briefly um, outline our guidelines at this point. Let me just say that where, where they are, I think, at this point. Um, so at this point, we've developed the guidelines. It's a pretty strong draft. Um, I think we hesitate to f say final because the guidelines will really will be taken out to the tribal communities so they can see whether or not this works for them. We, we understand that um, they might come back with their own 
um, protocols uh, for us to work with. Uh, that is the case with Pascuayaki, for instance, where they sent us their own um, practices or uh, preferences. So what we want to do is make sure that these are, this is basically a set of approach, which again is in line with the, our, 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 our protocols. Um, but it's sort of you know, a way for us to endorse that we accept the protocols. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, hopefully in the Q&A. So our, so our statement of purpose follows is to uphold conscientious stewardship for archival materials by or about indigenous peoples, to affirm a commitment to provide guidance for researchers. The UOA strives to improve existing relationships and develop new relationships with sovereign tribal governments. And these are our guiding principles, specifically for special collections. Special Collections seeks to consult with indigenous communities to identify culturally sensitive material contained in its collections. We seek to consult with indigenous communities to develop appropriate limitations and access to and use of culturally sensitive materials within its collections. And we seek to ensure that researchers requesting access to culturally sensitive materials have the appropriate permission to do so. And these are just quickly um, a sort of general sense of the case studies we've handled. Um, again, like you said, you know, you're sort of developing these things, but uh, things come up. So we've been uh, developing relationships, like with Pascuayaki. Um, we've tried with, with Tohono O'odham, um, and we've reached out to Navajo. We, t we generally are, and in our guidelines, um, we say that we we're generally contacting the CPOs uh, cultural preservation officers, heritage preservation officers, depending on who the tribe um, offers as a representative. So we're very cognizant of trying to work within the government, um, you know, so that we're not sort of just asking somebody on campus, um, we're really working with the government that way. So some of the things that we've handled are, again, we also have a lot of ethnographic materials um, so in some cases, uh, when we have material that could be culturally sensitive, um, we have restricted, um, but with the intent of consultation, um, we are trying not to restrict ahead of time, but in some cases it's, it seems pretty clear. So we've consulted with um, the Navajo Nation, for instance, in one case. Um, we're also putting in place sort of this idea of referring uh, donors to heritage centers where they, where they are, where they are available. Um, and then we've consulted with multiple tribal representatives on just you know, material access, some of which has been restricted uh, by one tribe, um, but we've been able to work with both of them to open it up so that the other tribe can um, look at material for their research purposes. So those are just some of some cases that we've had to handle so far. So our next steps are to finalize um, and share the guidelines. We're continuing to do, do, do that on campus. Um, uh, we've shared with our indigenous circle, um, which is a set of people all over campus that um, work with indigenous studies, methodologies, uh, student support. Um, all of those networks. Um, we've also shared with the Tri-University um, Native American Educators uh, Group, um, and we continue to do those kinds of um, internal uh, campus sharing as well as with uh, the tribes when um, these cases come up. So somebody mentioned sort of on a case-by-case -case basis. I think um, so far that's what it's been, and we've had to talk with our administrators that in, it, it's not going to be a, sort of one blanket way of, of handling things. It's going to be a lot of conversation. It's going to be a lot of um, being open-minded um, where our values are sort of intention, our values meaning our library values for access, but uh, potentially not, you know, that's, that's in, in, um, not in accordance with their values, et cetera. So we've had to do a lot of, a lot of that. And um, we will be creating uh, libguides now that 
Special Collections is entering the world of LibGuides, finally, thank you. Um, and so that uh, we'll be putting up sort of the guides that we've developed um, along with some of the, um, the research notes. Um, and we're developing the next phase of the guidelines as we were uh, developing with them. And by the way, Nia Wallace is here, one of my team members for that group. Anthony Sanchez couldn't be here. Um, and so, we're, but we've started to develop best practices uh, in terms of uh, acquisitions, um, description, all of those things that we haven't started to develop, but we, we knew we outlined areas that we needed to start developing. So we're working with our sponsors who are our dean of libraries and our vice dean um, who are very much in support of, thankfully, you know, very much in support of the protocols, very much in support of uh, us developing guidelines. Um, and so that's where we are at this point. I think that's all. So I think maybe during the Q&A we can entertain questions. Yeah, and so I think that this is a good opportunity for us to kind of open the floor for a few minutes to answer any questions that you may have about any of the things that Veronica and I touched upon in regards to auditing, uh, either uh, in regards to uh, how we implemented audits or if you have other general questions. Yes. Hey. <laughs> so I'm in library school and I just wanted to give you a shout out. Um, I think it's so important that um, you're publishing about the work that you do because we know in library school we're not always reading um, pieces by people of color, especially about indigenous and Latinx work. So I appreciate that. Um, and one question is for the Arizona Board of Regents tribal consultation policy. Is that for all the state schools? So it's all three universities, NAU, ASU, and U of A, um, and they're linked off of the website. So they're for everybody to follow, yeah. Yes. Oh, how long did it take you to do the, not the consultations, the auditing? How long did it take you to do that? How long? how many materials, um, who was involved, that sort of nitty gritty stuff. So I don't have the numbers of collections, but like I said, it was over, we had over a thousand collections, right? So we had to search them. And then, you know, from there, some fell out of the over 1,000 collections we had. And again, we were just focusing on process collections. Um, but it took, it took years because when I started this in about 2006, I really didn't have the, the resource to, to do it. I, I started off, me, myself, and then I started off with GAs, um, but we really needed somebody to focus on that for, it took us, when we actually really did it without the false starts um, with Wendell Cox was nine months. It was like a baby, nine months it took to do that. And again, it was just focused on process collections. So if you go and, and do additional, you know, your photographic collections, your audiovisual, it might take longer. Um, and, and it was very much, you know, bringing out materials, looking through them, touching them. Um, so it took that long to do that. Is that, is that the, uh, yeah. Nicholas, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can say that our, the Stephen is right back there. Uh, our audit also, um, it, it took several years to conduct um, and in some respects is continuously evolving as we uh, come across new issues or uh, establish new partnerships um, for, um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but as new issues arise, uh, we tailor uh, our, um, our information um, accordingly and, and also uh, provide the, the auditing spreadsheet that we use in advance to potential depositors, <clears throat> excuse me, that way they can um, get a feel for, uh, for, our, for our protocols 
and, and also they can use that within their communities to kind of see that this is um, a sort of standard that we're using and that other organizations are adopting as well. So it definitely took uh, uh, quite a number of years and it's still going on. Anybody else? Great. So um, I have a, maybe this is a good question for you, Nicholas. So one of our major collections that people are, are sort of anxious for us to get audited um, has materials in, um, I'm going to get this wrong, Numu, I believe, which is Paiute, Northern Paiute, as well as Swedish. So materials written in Swedish about Paiute peoples. Where would you find resources for someone who speaks both those things? <laughs> I, I mean, we have to address this for real. Like, I don't, I don't know. No, that's an excellent question. So first off, uh, uh, resources, um, for one, would be contacting the tribe uh, as, a, as a starting point. Um, uh, when, when we're talking about maybe a language such as Swedish, uh, a, a great place to start is if you're on, a, are you on a college campus? So um, whether you're on a college campus or not is to go uh, to their language department. Uh, often they can provide you with resources for people to, uh, to talk with. Um, they're sort of a, they can, um, language departments can easily be uh, an avenue for putting you in touch with the right sort of people. And, and that's, that's ultimately, um, and, and we have dealt with that before as well. Um, we have a, uh, um, for example, you know, Creek materials that are also translated into Arabic, so that can become difficult, or Omaha, uh, we have an Omaha cookbook that's translated into German, and, and so what you have to do is look at the various uh, entities involved, and some of those, um, um, you know, it, it can be tricky and can take time, and you may not have the resources available right there on your campus, but you have people who um, can can lead you to the right sources. Anybody else? Um, my name's Jessica Crouch. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Archive Space. Uh, so I'm here to learn about the protocols, but you specifically mentioned that you are using Archive Space. So is there anything that we could do with the application that would make it easier for institutions looking to adopt the protocol? Excellent question that uh, we actually, so the OU ARC project actually um, uh, just came to fruition within the last six months. So uh, we, uh, our, uh, our organization is actually the newest of the campus entities to join into what is essentially a, a, a consortium of groups. And so we're learning a lot about uh, archive space and I know that there was the recent update to archive space as well. So uh, the interface, et cetera, and how that all comes together is something that we're in the process of learning. But if you have a business card, I would happily take it because as issues arise, that's, that's an important question that we have not contemplated. Um, but thus far, um, I can say that archive space has been very uh, user friendly. So uh, you can take that back to archive space. <laughs> And it might just be good to talk about some of the things that would that we would need, you know, not really thinking about archive space specifically. We also use archive space, but some of the things that we would need to hold together, you know, which may already be supported um, by the by the system, is you know the documentation in terms of, of restrictions, um, the collaborators, and in, in essence, kind of what's on the spreadsheet um, that we talked that you talked about earlier. Um, so if you can maybe start think, looking at that and, and thinking about how. So we've been sort of uh, making sure that we uh, try to accommodate, uh, you know, privacy concerns and an anonymity for, for all of you in attendance today. That's kind of why we're, we're doing it this way with the video and audio recordings and things like that. But uh, first off, uh, before I uh, let Mr. Wojcik, your, your trainer for today, uh, have the last word, I wanted to make an announcement. So I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, the SEMA uh, SSA joint conference uh, for having us here. I'm actually representing the Native American Archives section with the Society of American Archivists and the chair. Uh, so firstly, I want to thank uh, Amy Allen and uh, Lily Carroll. We also have Erica Castaño over there, uh, who really reached out to us 
the Native American Archives section, and uh, it's it, it's a joint effort for us to be able to put on this uh, this workshop, and so it kind of speaks largely to uh, the situation that's implementing the protocols entails, which is it's supposed to be um, we're all figuring this out together, <coughs> uh, inter organizationally, but also uh, as individuals. So that's kind of why we wanted to make sure that we bring everybody together, uh, as, as many folks as we could. We have about 16 people here right now, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to network with one another and continue these conversations that we're, we're trying to uh, conceptualize and sort of um, adapt and articulate into ways that you can tangibly and realistically uh, resolve uh, some of these issues that uh, were discussed. Um, but I wanted to make an announcement on NASA's behalf. So <clears throat> I recently got word saying that uh, we did receive Society of American Archivist Foundation funding, and so we're going to be financed to continue a, a series of webinars, sort of workshops, uh, to be able to create toolkits. And so the premise is to uh, equip uh, archivists and uh, other professionals working with Native American archives uh, collections uh, to be able to uh, approach uh, some of these uh, questions that we've, we've introduced uh, to you and uh, to be able to navigate those situations and to be able to educate internally also um, some of the folks that you'll be working with. So that will actually be launched later in the year. And so for this uh, workshop, <coughs> uh, specifically, it, again, it'll just be uh, made available online It'll be made available in a couple places. So one of the places is the SSA website. The other place is the Sustainable Heritage Network. The last place will be uh, the Society of American Archivists website also, okay?